Hello lovely people, my name is Emma and today I'm doing my wrap up for the month of October. So as you might hear in my voice, I am a bit under weather at the moment. I am uh, suffering from a bit of a cold and I'm quite croaky so humble apologies for that. But I wanted to get this filmed because I don't think I'm going to have another chance to do it anytime soon. So you're just going to have to deal with the croak. But it's okay, I've got my mug of tea here and I'm ready to chat about the books that I read in October. October can really be classified as reading month of books that were just fine. There was a lot of like 3 and 3.5 star, star reads. Nothing really blew me away which is a bit of a bummer and I did DNF a not insignificant chunk of my TBR. Um, so sorry if this one's a little bit of a Debbie Downer but hey ho. The first book I finished is called The Outlaw by Lily Grayson. This is a romance novella. It is a western and it's one of the first westerns that I've read in the romance genre. Um, it was fun. Uh, I do think novellas suffer from the fact that you don't have much space to explore the characters properly and that the plot often suffers for the kind of length of the book. Um, also the western kind of felt quite underdeveloped in places. Basically it's about a woman who is kidnapped when a group of bandits come to her town and um, try and like uh, steal from the bank and then in doing so she gets kind of caught up with them and taken hostage and it is about how the leader of the bandits might secretly have a heart of gold and actually be a good man. Um, it follows the standard beats you'd expect for a romance and it was quite cute but there was a fair amount of miscommunication at the end that got a bit irritating and its representation of Native Americans was a sketch at best. The next book that I finished is Pine by Frances Toon. This is a book set in Scotland and it is about a family who are really really struggling through both poverty but also substance abuse. It is about a girl who is quite young and her father and their mother died in very mysterious circumstances a good couple of years ago. It is about her seeing, starting to see her mother's ghost and sort of creepy stuff happening as well as some girls going missing in the town as well and sort of the way that old crimes and new crimes can end up being embroiled together. It was one of these books that's incredibly fun whilst reading it. It really felt like a um, sort of creepy horror version of Gone Girl um, with sort of references to like ghosts and sort of spooky supernatural haunting um, and definitely had fun with like haunted house vibes and the two unreliable narrators of the often quite drunk dad and the incredibly young girl made for quite fun reading where you weren't too sure what was going on. But I think its greatest strength was also its biggest downfall because whenever I like stopped reading it I'd be sat there being like the hell just even happened in this book and when I finished it I was definitely left fairly confused about the plot and it felt very fever dreamy. So it was fun and definitely great for like the winter spooky atmosphere and I really haven't read many books set in Scotland so I really enjoyed that aspect to it but I don't think the plotting is particularly tight and I don't think the pacing works particularly great. The next book that I finished is The King's Witch by Tracy Borman. This is a historical fiction set in the reign of James the First or that very early transition between Elizabeth the First and James the First. James the First was incredibly uh, Protestant, very anti-Catholic and also um, pioneered a lot of witch hunting in the UK. Tracy Borman has written a non-fiction book called Witches about this exact topic which I've loved and I've read and loved um, so I was really intrigued to check out her fiction. This one I think suffered from pacing more than anything else. The setting is lovely, you can tell she knows tons about the historical um, setting and like what was going on at the time but it kind of felt like a foregone conclusion and it felt like it was longer than necessary. This book covers the um, uncovering of the gunpowder plot which was an attempt to basically assassinate James I as well as the entire like uh, parliament at the time by blowing it up and it's something which um, was not successful, spoiler alert, but if you are from somebody, like if you're from the UK, you know about this already because it is basically bonfire night that we celebrate on November 5th and I spent a lot of my childhood making Guy Fawkes um, out of like old clothes and stuffing them with newspaper and then setting fire to the effigy because um, who doesn't love a wonderful pagan ritual of burning a supposed traitor to the crown. So because of the fact that you know full well the gunpowder plot isn't going to go ahead it felt like the tension really wasn't there in the book because you know they're gonna get caught and it's just kind of waiting game of when so for me it really felt like um, it was a bit impotent kind of reading it because it was a foregone conclusion which is always a danger with historical books that are set incredibly closely against events that did actually happen um, but also I really felt that our main character was very um, 
again like impotent in this story and really didn't have much control over it. Turns out this is actually a trilogy and I don't think I'm going to be continuing. Tracy Borman's writing style is fantastic and if you know very little about the gunpowder plot totally check it out as a way of learning but if like me it's an area of history that you feel quite comfortable within um, possibly it's not worth the time because it's just a bit longer than it realistically needs to be. The next book that I finished was actually a total surprise and definitely one of the best of the month and that is Downstation by Simon Morden. I thought that this was a like dystopian book about a London where water was like a, a sort of commodity that kind of like water world where it was what people were kind of trading against. I was completely wrong. This is actually a dark portal fantasy where London gets set on fire and a bunch of people stumble who are like trapped in the underground stumble through a door that takes them to a completely different magical world where ruling factions are sort of um, kidnap them and force them into slavery. It is way darker than I expected and way more kind of fantasy based. Not even high fantasy because I don't think it has the like medieval style structure that you see of high fantasy but it is sort of like that high fantasy adjacent where it is playing around with magic systems, playing around with castles, um, there's no modern technology and there's definitely some sort of feuding families as such that get dragged into it. I really enjoyed our characters, I especially love the character growth for our two main characters, I thought that they were really interesting, both of them started out so naive in so many different ways and they end up going on a really sort of epic story to kind of discover their own inner strength but in incredibly different ways. Um, so yeah, really really good fun. I thought it ended on a little bit of a cliffhanger and I know that this is book one in at least it's definitely a duology maybe there's more um, and it is quite frustrating when you read a fantasy series and you're like ah and now I have to read the other one to like get this off my TBR um, but I did really enjoy it I enjoyed the world building I thought it had a lovely flow to it and the pacing felt really good and yet yeah, completely different to what I was expecting so this was a slam dunk winner from absolutely out of nowhere I just managed to like fully kick my camera stand across the room where on earth were we Okay, the next book that I finished is actually the only non-fiction I've managed to finish this month. It's been a bit of a weak month for non-fiction, apologies. And that is When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt by Cara Cooney. This is a book that I was either going to give two stars or five stars to, dependent entirely on which section of it I was in. It covers six queens of Egypt who ruled as kings at various points and looked at their rule and what it was like to be a woman monarch in ancient Egypt. Now I know very little about ancient Egypt so it's really cool to fill in some gaps for me knowledge wise but I didn't really like Cara Cooney's writing style. This is for two main reasons. First of all she made a lot of sweeping assertions in the book that I felt like weren't backed up properly and whilst I was listening to an audiobook so maybe they're stronger referencing the physical form she didn't really tell the reader how we know these things. For example when we've got like um, reliefs in ancient Egypt where you've got the original um, carving is scratched away and a new carving is put over the top. I would really like to know what scientific um, techniques we use to be able to know these things of what's scratched on below and how we can know the order of them and indeed the time in between them because this seemed to be like a really key component to a lot of the propaganda surrounding both the Queen's rule but then also after they stopped ruling when they died how their legacies were tried to be wiped away. She also made a couple of incredibly bold assertions that I just get the feeling are probably more controversial in Egyptology than she was letting on. When you read a fair amount of non-fiction you definitely get start to get a bit of a sense for when somebody is simplifying something and really just giving you their view of the debate rather than a sort of more overarching understanding of the controversy and every field of inquiry is going to have the areas where experts don't agree and there's a lot of evidence on both sides and I really feel like Cara Cooney did a very bad job of signposting when these were and it was just sort of my spidey senses were tingling when reading because we'd make some very bold statements with nothing to back them up. So I was a little bit concerned about that and really wanted to um, have a bit more background knowledge as to exactly why she believed these things and what evidence there is. There is an argument to say it should be in the references but I think it really is on the author, especially of non-fiction books, to actually build into the text the evidence for this because it is unreasonable to expect your reader to go away and read a bunch of different journals. Plus if you're not especially given a lot of those journals like often behind paywalls in other languages that kind of thing, you know academia is not something everybody has access to. Also I do think that if you know what you're referencing you're probably not going to be referencing the other side of the debate because you are very strongly believing one side and I do think it is the responsibility of good impartial academics to actually show both sides and then to strengthen their side and give the evidence of why they believe it rather than just completely ignoring the controversy as a whole. 
So for me, Cara Cooney's work was very um, descriptive and it had a very kind of narrative style to it, but I was really looking for the nitty gritty of like how and why we know these things. Because as far as I'm concerned, the history of an area in terms of like the history of us discovering it is just as interesting as the information that we are discovering in the first place. Possibly I'm in a minority here, but do let me know in the comments down below how you like your non-fictions to handle that kind of thing. And if you like to know how we know things from history, not just what we know or what we think we know. The other thing that I really struggled with with Cara Cooney's work was she was incredibly determined to make very long sweeping statements about feminism, women in power and women across society as a whole. And she was very keen to link it back to, granted a couple other people, but overwhelmingly the Clinton versus Trump election of uh, 2016 in America, which I really wasn't expecting in my book about ancient Egypt. I have read more about Trump in a book about ancient Egypt than any other book that I've read this year. And that feels wrong to be able to say. So I just really felt like she was crowbarring in things that were not necessary. And you know, are separated by literally thousands of years and an entirely different societal structure. And yes, we can make general comments about women in power but I don't think for like the connections made any sense. I really wanted Cara to show her working here for how she was connecting Clinton's email scandal to like Nefertiti. That's not something that I think is particularly relevant and it was doubly frustrating because we didn't have that information for how she'd found out about this history. I really felt like if you just cut a load of the deterministic women are automatically going to be more gentle rulers nonsense out of the book and put in some stuff about the actual like how did we find these things out it would have been a much stronger read. Having said all of this, the bits where we were just like hanging out in ancient Egypt, chatting about their lifestyles and how the monarchy worked, I had a really good time with because I know so little about ancient Egypt. And it is very much cemented that this is an area that I want to go and look into a bit more, so that if nothing else, I can see if my spidey senses about Kara Cooney's assertions were correct or not. The final book that I finished this month is The Talent of Mr. Ripley by uh, Patrick Highsmith. This is a classic from... This was published in 1955, ah, later than I expected, and is a uh, sort of contemporary classic crime book that is about Tom Ripley, who is kind of a down on his luck con man, who gets sent to Europe to try and locate this man's son and convince him to come back to America. And is it him getting embroiled in um, the life of, of this guy, Dickie, um, his obsession with him that then ends up becoming quite violent, and then his sort of desperate ploy to try and escape detection as lie after lie and crime after crime pile on top of each other. It was one that I really didn't know what to expect going in and was surprisingly good fun. I was a little bit bored for the first third and then stuff started to properly happen. And uh, yeah, it just got more and more zany, more and more convoluted and the lies kept piling up and the identities kept piling up and it was just really fun. It has a slightly more violent version of like, catch me if you can kind of vibes. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy Patricia Heisman's writing style. I listened to this on audiobook and I think it worked really well. And Tom Ripley is one of the most like, sociopathic, completely unlikable, but surprisingly likable um, narrators that I've read in a long time. So really, really entertaining read. It is book one of a series that I didn't realise and I will not be continuing with the series unless I end up picking up like the second book in this kind of collection if they've even in done, indeed done it in like the Virago modern classics. Not because I didn't enjoy it but just because I think life is too short and I struggle with series in general and I think it ends in quite a nice place and I'm quite happy to leave it as it is. But it's one that I would suggest if you are a fan of almost like Raymond Chandler, but not quite, like a little bit more of a cozier Raymond Chandler and indeed this sort of like heist, trying to get away with stuff, sort of mounting lies kind of um, fiction. So yeah, really good fun. Now I'm gonna briefly talk about three books that I DNF'd just because they were on my October TBR and I just wanna cover kind of why I decided to abandon them. I don't often talk about DNF books on this channel, but I feel like I had good reasons for all three of them. Also, some of them are in challenges and stuff, so you'll probably end up asking me about them at some point in the comments. Uh, the Witches, Salem 1692, a history by Stacey Schrift. I abandoned so bloody early on in it. This is a beefy book that is about the Salem witch trials and it really is an example of why um, just because you know a lot in an area doesn't mean that you should write about that area. Stacey Schrift is incredibly determined to show off just how much she researched about this book and just how much she knows about the minutia detail. And I don't think she has any real idea of how to organize the ideas in a macro meta way that makes them actually intelligible to an outside reader. And I was so bogged down and bored by the trial that 
that I was already losing track of what was happening. I checked out a few reviews on Goodreads and a lot of people who, even the ones who spoke positively about it, really were the ones who were commending her high level of detail, which was exactly the thing that was turning me off, so I opted to abandon this book in favour of some other things and I'm so pleased I did because it's chunky and it was taking me a century. The next book I abandoned is The Solitaire Mystery by Justine Gardner. I got much further through this one but ultimately the very young narrator is what turned me off from it. It's sort of a weird absurdist fantasy and it is a young boy and his father travelling across Europe to try and find his missing mother, although the boy is secretly not very convinced that they're actually going to find him. And then the boy gets embroiled in some weird kind of mythology um, fairy tale thing going on where he gets given a tiny story by a dwarf and it all kind of spirals from there and he finds himself in a mysterious world. Um, I abandoned it because the kids writing like the writing style of the very young narrator was incredibly plain and I just wasn't really that connected with the fantasy world for it and I didn't really feel like it was going anywhere and I wasn't that bothered about any of the characters so I decided to walk away. And then the final one is The Murder in the Rue The Murders in the Rue Morgue and Other Tales by Edgar Allan Poe and this one really suffered from the fact that I just don't generally enjoy short stories. It's incredibly rare that I find a short story um, collection that I actually find entertaining. I find the short form just really frustrating to get into because it feels like I'm trying to start a new book every single time and I don't have room to really build a relationship with the characters. My least favourite part of reading is the first 5-10% to 10 of any book where I'm really like trying to sink into the world and for me short stories is just that same 5-10% to 10 repeated over and over and over again. So like I read a few of the stories in this, I think I did four or five in total including like his big one which is the like cask of arm or whatever it's called. But his stories are very short short stories, I think the longest in here is only like 30 or 40 pages, most of them are coming in at like 10 to 15 and I'm just not here for that as a style of writing. So even though I enjoyed his writing style uh, I'm just not going to finish it, it was just becoming an absolute bore um, but I might check out if he has any other long longer form stuff which I genuinely don't actually know off the top of my head if Edgar Allan Poe wrote anything like longer so do let me know in the comments down below. So that is it from me an incredibly croaky um, uh, uh, October wrap up I'd entirely forgotten what video we were even doing then I'm feeling a little bit lightheaded so I'm gonna go drink my tea and then I might try and film an end of year uh, book tag and see how well that goes. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, do let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books or if you agree or disagree and uh, have a wonderful reading week and I will chat to you soon. Bye!